Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Siemens with Jeff Wilson. I'm going to talk today about electromigration and IR drop and problems associated with that. Jeff, what sort of problems are you starting to see with electromigration and IR drop? Those have always been with us, but why is it becoming more of a problem now? Well, really, it's because the technology is getting so advanced that it needs to be, it's going to have that resistance values and different things that are going to be paying more and more of an impact on it. And you need to be able to have not only the knowledge of what is needs to be worked on, but you need to understand the layout so that you can bring those two things together to solve the challenges. What's behind the drive to, to address these? You know, what, what are you seeing here now that you didn't see before? Well, really, the foundries have come through and they've told us that this is, this is how their technology is changing. And so we're having customers come to us and say, can you help us be able to solve these problems? And so what we're going to be talking about today is how we do that. Let's take a closer look. Sure, let's go ahead and do that. Jeff, what are we looking at? Well, one of the things, this is actually came from TSMC when they were able to share this at their OIP conference. As you can see here, this is the... Green line here is the capacitance value. The blue line is the resistance and seeing the impact. It is definitely switched as we get down into the smaller technology nodes. So what is really apparent is, is how critical being able to manage the resistance in your designs are going to be going forward. And that resistance is going to generate heat. It's going to cause all sorts of early aging of the circuits. You've got all sorts of problems that come with that, right? Yes. In fact, the, one of the problems that also impacts, of course, is the IR drop. And to be able to, there are certain targets that have to be achieved. And if you miss that, you're going to, of course, going to have a bad die. And IR drop is going to affect signal integrity because your signals won't go through at, at the rate you're expecting them to go through, right? Exactly. And so you're going to be able to have it so that you, you're going to have to be able to look at the layout and be able to understand how you can make those modifications to be able to achieve those goals. Why does that get worse at each new node? It's just because the things are getting closer together and they're getting taller. And that's just going to give you more area for that resistance value to be able to really have an impact. And you've got thermal effects that come in here too and all sorts of physical effects that weren't there before as well, right? Yes, very much so. And there are different challenges that you have to be in different ways that you have to solve those problems. So how do you solve those problems? Well, one of the things that we're doing is we're using some of the technology that is built in Caliber yeah, to be it. able to come up with and make layout modifications to solve it and be able to help you achieve your uh, different EMIR requirements. Does this vary from foundry to foundry? It varies from foundry to foundry somewhat, but as you get down into the new advanced technologies, they all face the same challenge and problems. You've got to be able to manage that resistance value. A lot of this is, is physical challenges. What kinds of challenges are you going to face, and let's dig into how you actually solve these. Well, there's a number of things you've got to be able to do is, you know, while you're solving a problem, you can't go ahead and just keep iterating on it because the time to market windows continue to shrink. And so what you have to do is you have to have a complete understanding of the DRC rules and to be able to address them properly. Let's take a closer look at some of these physical challenges. Okay. And so as I look over here, this here is representative of the different rules that we have going on. What you see here is the VIA rule count at um, 28 nanometer. And this is the, on the other side, of course, is at three nanometer. What you're seeing here is an order of magnitude increase in the number of DRC checks related to just VS. So you have a lot more data that you have to sift through here, right? Very much so. And not only do you have to know the, uh, the rules, because there's a couple of different ways that you can attack it. You can attack it by being able to be conservative. And so one of the things that we're finding uh, that our customers are telling us about is the fact that, hey, I'm DRC clean, but not all DRC clean mean the same thing. We have a customer and they're talking about their experience with our tool. They came and they have, look it, I have a DRC clean design at five nanometer. Okay. And they says, but what can you do? Because I am having IR drop issues. And they says, well, we go ahead and we provided them a solution that they would then take and they would automatically run. 
And they were able to add, in this large SOC design, over 9 million more vias. And they were all DRC clean. So you have an example where you have a place and route tool, completed their efforts, they gave out and produced a DRC clean design, that's great, but what the customer needed is he needed some additional help to be able to address his IR drop issues and the, just the sheer improve the manufacturability of his design. And so they ran our solution on it and it was able to add those additional vias in, over 9 million, and they were still DRC clean. Something tells me that that customer was very happy that one versus a DRC clean that was given by place and route or a DRC clean that was done with the caliber solution. A lot of this used to be handled with margin in the past as you go into the upper nodes, right? I mean, the Foundry uh, rule deck had lots of margin built in because they would come in and, and fix whatever problems that were in the design. And then they, then it got passed along to the shifted left back into the design side and said, okay, you handle the margin yourself. But now as we get down into five, three nanometers, we don't have any margin at all. That's exactly right. You know, and the problem, is, the problem is getting more complicated. That's the requirements to be able for your EMIR results. But then the design rules are getting more complicated and it's all coming together. And so it's really important that you provide a system that really looks at the uh, reducing the cost of support while being able to make it easier to use. Do you need AI machine learning in any of this as well? It's always helpful, but when you're really talking about getting down there and looking at that, there's only so much that you can do with layout, all right? And you, but you need to find the best way to be able to solve the problem. And so there's different ways of being able to do it. It's not so much a machine learning, but it is an, an um, AI type of an application. Is this bringing together different groups and skills that, that existed in the past? So in the past, you, you had the PR guys who were doing the, the place and route, and then you had the other guys who were working off of things like uh, all the electrostatic issues and the physical effects. Are they now one and the same, and are they the same training that you need? Well, really, the important thing here is that you take the analysis, electrical analysis, and combine it with the physical analysis. And you bring those two things together, and that's how you're really going to be able to come up with the best solution possible. So this, what happens when you add in things like backside power delivery? Well, of course, that's going to help, right? And the problem, though, is, is as we all know, we're never happy, right? You've got a marketing guy is going to come to you and say, you know what, you need to take it to the next level now that you've got the backside. And so there's still going to be the pressure on us to be able to hit whatever targets that they specify and say that the market actually requires. The beauty of having Caliber in there is, is that it has a whole toolbox to be able to go ahead and grab and pull from. And so as the things shift, we're able to go ahead and shift and be able to make those layout modifications. Because really what we're doing is we're basing those layout modifications on analysis. And that's what's really going to help us be able to do the great job. You brought up changes, and there's a. It's really interesting because you've got a, engineering change orders, which potentially can can add in things you didn't expect early in the design cycle. How does that affect what you're doing here? Well, it definitely affects it. Okay, but the did what it just does is just boost things around. You still need to get the same analysis to come in to see what the impact is. But the really the key point here is is that any time you put layout modifications back in. They must be DRC clean. One of the other big shifts that's going on here is that chips are expected to last longer in the marketplace than they were in the past. So you have things like automotive where you expect it to last sometimes up to 10, 15 years. But even in the data center, it used to be four years and they throw everything out and replace it. Now it's, it's up to six, seven years. What does that do to the design here and how do you address that? Well, one of the things that you want to do is you want to make sure that your design is as robust as possible. And that really gets into the whole message of DFM. And what you want to be able to do, though, it has to go back. You have to analyze it and be able to see what the electrical impacts are going to be because that's going to tell you where you need to focus and how you need to be able to make your changes to your layout, whether it's just the widening of the wires or adding parallel run lengths. Is there anything different that has to happen now as you start moving down into these uh advanced nodes in terms of engineering training, in terms of using how the tools that are out there? Yeah, that's, 
that's a constant battle, right? And the fact is, is that what we've done is we've focused on addressing three different areas of ease of use. First of all, the foundries, okay? They've got all kinds of pressure. They're coming out with new technology, different metal stacks, all of the stuff that adds up. They don't want to have to go ahead and support a new tool, okay? But what we have to have from them and that they need to provide is the design rules. And so since we're going to be looking at doing very specific layouts, we can reduce the huge DRC rule deck down to very specific ones. And we'll, we give it to them in a very easy to use fashion, an ASCII file basically that contains all the information that they need. The second area that we want to be able to tackle is CAD, CAD teams. They need to take these things and, and be able to introduce it into their design flow so that designers can easily use it. And so we've really used industry standard interfaces to be able to make that easy of use. We read left def or GDS or ACES, whichever they want to be able to provide to us, and then we make our layout modifications. The key though is, is that every single layout modification we make, we're able to then back annotate it with an incremental def format to be able to get that in there. So what is the, what's the impact on the design teams? Well, thanks for asking that, because that, that's the third area that we wanted to be able to focus on. They have so much to deal with. You need to make it as push button as you possibly can. What they want to do is they want to specify what nets or what areas that they want us to be able to work on and really just push a button. Whether they're getting access to this technology through a batch operation or through you know, so tools such as real-time digital, we're able to then go ahead and let them push those buttons. We go through, we make the modifications, we bring that, that information back in and then they just go ahead and they run their timing analysis and their power, the EMIR analysis on the results. One of the challenges here is that you've got so much more data. You've got much more complexity than you had in the past. How does that affect time to market? Because the market windows also are shrinking at the same time. And that is an excellent point. And the real thing here is, is that you got to make sure that when you make a, mi a modification, that when it, since the tool is the foundry sign off with caliber, okay, you need to make sure that your changes are going to be ERC clean, okay? So you want to be able to, if you can achieve that, then you're able to then shorten that time to market because you're removing those iterations that just lengthen the whole time to market. Jeff Wilson, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much, Ed. Appreciate the time.